Hello everybody, Adam Savage here in my cave. I like to say that Tested is not a how-to channel, it is more a what just happened channel. Uh, I certainly film myself uh, making lots of mistakes, and so there are a lot of the builds I do on this channel that I don't think of as how-tos because I don't consider myself having any authority about how to do a thing that I have just figured out how to do. Uh, that requires a point of view and some experience. But occasionally I do have some how-to videos and today is one of them. It's one I realized I thought of years ago and I can't believe I haven't gotten around to. And it's the $5 sword. $5 sword! We're going to make a sword today using a paucity of materials. A very small amount of inexpensive materials. And we're going to make a pretty fun and easy to construct sword. You could follow along and make your own and make however many you want. Um, this is a design I came up with um, in two different ways. First, uh, I built my first version of this sword when I was 16. That was shortly after I'd seen Excalibur, John Borman's amazing film, which went on to inspire my own construction of Excalibur. See this footage here? I made one out of aluminum like the movie swords. I also eventually took my obsession for Excalibur all the way to Cornwall, England, where Terry Master Armor, Terry English, taught me how to make armor while he and I made me a set of King Arthur's armor. But back when I was 16, I didn't have any of that knowledge. I just wanted an Excalibur sword. And my house, I grew up in a suburban house in Terrytown, New York. Uh, and my house had uh, that, uh, that slatting uh, on the bottom of my front porch, you know, those wood slats that are about an inch and a half wide and however long, and there's just like, you know, cross slats. You can see through the squares. Uh, and we had tons of that surrounding some of the parts of our house, and one of those slat pieces came off. It was about a quarter inch wide and something like seven feet long and about an inch and a half. So it was a quarter inch thick, about an inch and a half wide. And I took it and I cut it into a sword shape and I sanded it into a sword shape and... Uh, I made it my very first sword, and I was very pleased with it. Uh, cut to, let's see, I was 16. Cut to maybe eight years later. I am living in San Francisco, and it is a theater town. And my friend Rich calls me up and says he's working on a Shakespeare play, and they could use some swords. Um, do I have any? I said, I don't, but I have this way of building them that would be really inexpensive. If you guys could pay me like 10 bucks per sword, I could make you probably like 15 swords. And they were like, we don't have anything close to that kind of budget. <laughs> this is what theater is totally like. Uh, but I'm about to do for you what I was going to do for my friend's Shakespeare play. And by the way, if you are in a theater, this is a great way to get some reasonable stage plays, at least for rehearsing with and with a little finesse, definitely for performing with. Um, the $5 sword. I have not costed this out to an exact $5 amount. There are some things that cost, well, let me start with the materials list and then we'll talk about the $5 sword appellation that I've given it. Um, this is a piece of poplar I had. It's uh, slightly thicker than the slat that I was working with back when I was 16 years old, but anything close to this will kind of do. Uh, you could even, uh, if you if you have access to a bandsaw blade, take a two by four and slice a thin slice off of it. That is completely reasonable. But uh, many lumber yards will have timber like this that you could utilize. Um, you could take apart a pallet that something got shipped on and mill it down on a bandsaw or even on a table saw, though I would do that with real supervision. Um, not fun to do big, thick cuts of thin material on a table saw. Not fun at all. Not for the faint of heart. But it all begins with this. A piece of lumber that, uh, in this case, is about three-eighths of an inch thick. It is about three inches wide. We won't need that full width. And right now I'm saying this is probably just about four feet long. We're going to draw a sword on this. We're going to cut it out. You could use a coping saw. You could use a hand saw. You could use a jigsaw. Any saw you have access to will be sufficient for cutting out the sword shape. Uh, am I getting ahead of myself? No, I don't think so. All right, so here's the materials. Piece of wood, uh, some electrical tape, some aluminum plumber's tape, some kitchen twine, 
some uh, CA glue. Now, a roll of this stuff, about 10 bucks. However, it'll make like 50 swords for you. So let's say about 50 cents worth of material. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, no, that's even less. That's like 20 cents of material per sword. Yeah, you get a lot out of this. So I'm not calling this a $10 expense. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm saying you're just using like a few pennies worth of aluminum tape. Kitchen twine, I'm assuming you have access to some kind of twine. It really barely matters what kind of twine you use the way we're going to use it. Electrical tape, found in almost every house. I like it because it's made of vinyl and it stretches and that will be uh, beneficial to us later. CA glue. Now, this is my uh, fast glue of choice, but if you don't have access to a crazy glue or a CA glue, by all means, you could use, uh, for this build, you could use wood glue. You could use epoxy. You could use an all-purpose glue. All of them would work just fine. Um, this, is a, uh, this is both a material and glue agnostic build. You could kind of use anything you wanted to do it. Um, I'm going to do it in one specific way, but as I go, I'll keep on explaining um, the, 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 that you don't need a full shop for this build under any circumstance. Uh, and this is probably achievable by pretty much anybody in a day or two, if you take some time. Um, we're going to be, after we cut out the blade, we're going to be shaping it. And I'll be shaping it with uh, probably a, uh, an orbital sander and a plane. And again, planes, uh, which is, uh, here, is a, uh, here is a Stanley plane. Um, these are not exotic tools. Pick one up on a Craigslist for five or ten bucks. Uh, again, I, I, I wanted this build to not use a lot of exotic tools and materials. I wanted it to feel accessible. Uh, and so every time I'm using something and you think, I don't have one of those, I hope that I have contributed the thing that you do have that you could do this with. To begin this build, first you need to decide on the size and shape of the sword that you are making. Uh, and I'm going to start in pencil. But I am going to make a bunch of marks in, uh, in Sharpie because it doesn't matter. Normally, I don't like making marks on uh, stuff that's going to be hero-sided in Sharpie because Sharpie tends to bleed through paint. But we're not painting any of this. We are simply uh, covering our blade with aluminum tape. And it's going to be like, ah. I know I did a version of this when I made Hellboy's sword, which is hanging up there behind me. Um, but this is just... Uh, this is a much quicker and dirtier way of getting this kind of a very similar result. So I'm not going to make a huge long sword here. I think I'm going to make a very medium-sized short sword, uh, kind of a Roman gladius. Is that what you call it? Um, I'm also going to make mine quite wide, I think. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Um, okay, so... That is about two and a quarter inches wide, which means that an inch and an eighth would be the middle. And it's important to mark the center of your blade. That is going to matter. Okay, so now uh, I'm actually going to make these marks in... I would like to show you something here. What I've got here is a piece of wood on which I have a center mark and a cut mark. This is the center of my sword blade. That is the outside edge I'm gonna cut. Now, I would like to tr do these lines in Sharpie. So, how do you draw a really nice, I just drew these lines out of pencil and they're really nice and straight. And if you were looking carefully, you might've saw seen how I did it. Um, what I'm doing is, I'm utilizing my fingers as a stop for the mark that I want to make. So if I have, if I want to make this mark, what I'm doing is actually, yeah, let's do it this way. I want to make a mark right here. I am going to hold my fingers in an orientation that provides a really nice basis. See that? I've got both my pinky and my ring finger touching the side. I've got my middle finger touching the top and I'm holding the pen between my middle index and thumb. And when I want to draw this line, I drop my pen and I go all the way down. 
Yeah. This, like, old girlfriend of mine taught me this technique. She was a framer, and it has, it changed my life the moment I saw it. There you go. And then you draw a really nice straight line. See that? Look at how straight that is. That's just done with soft flesh of my beat up fingers. Yeah. I love this technique. I use it almost every day. Uh, and I, I actually like it almost better than measuring sometimes because it, it lends a sort of a hand hewn look to things. It, these two sides might not be exactly perfect, but that's fine with me. Totally fine. Okay, so uh, let's see. I would like to, now it's time to draw the, this is gonna be where the base of my sword is. I'm just gonna use a square and uh, draw it across the base. I'm gonna continue the middle on down because I'm gonna use that. Okay, now I wanna draw the tip of the sword. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a sketch Yeah, there we go. And now it, it meets it across there. So I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. Yeah, that's pretty good. All right. Exactitude isn't critical here. Just getting pretty close is good enough. You're going to have plenty of chances to fix it up later. Um, I can see right now that this curve isn't going to be match that one. So I may need to do some more shaping of it once I... Yeah, something like that. Okay. I'm going to cut this out using a jigsaw. Oh, right, right, right. Uh, I've got this business down here. This is the center of the sword. And I want to actually mark off uh, a bit of this because this is actually, I'm going to make this the handle as well. So you see, I'm doing the same thing. I'm getting pretty darn close and I'm making the handle overly long. That is totally going to be overly long, and I'm going to cut it right about there. Actually, it's going to be yeah, probably about there, and I'm going to just I'm going to give myself more material than I need. And because I want to make sure I don't cut out the wrong thing, I'm going to mark off. This is a classic maker method for delineating what you are going to cut and what you are going to keep. And again, back here, go all like this. You might think, why would I need that? I can see where I want to cut. Yeah. I'm here to tell you, every time I don't do this, I practically cut something wrong almost every single time. Yeah. Here is the shape. That is going to be the handle, and there is the blade. Very, very simple. Re you can lay this out any which way you want. If you would like some reference, you can do a Google image search for uh, sword, short sword, Roman gladius, uh, two-handed sword, bastard sword, oak shot sword. I mean, if you really want to go, you can go get the oak shot sword book and blow these up and lay it down on a piece of paper. You could print it out. Uh, the number of ways you can create this template is literally infinite. But you can see I haven't spent too much time trying to finesse it. I'm just getting a general shape. Now I'm going to cut it out. I can cut it out with a coping saw. That would be a very easy way. I can cut it out with a handheld jigsaw. I'm going to cut it out on my bandsaw just because that's faster.
I hope you can see already how good we're doing. We, uh, we're on our way. Uh, now, like I said, these two shapes aren't equivalent. They're not perfect. Sometimes uh, what I'll do is I'll cut out the first shape like this. I'll cut out that shape and then I'll spin it over and use it to mark the other side. Uh, I didn't do that this time because I wanted to show you uh, that you could even rescue it if you don't do something like that. Um, I'm just going to use uh, a sander to uh, to bring these even. Um, I'm going to use a disc sander, but you could easily do this in a few minutes with a sanding block. All right, so now trying to get these even on the side that I've drawn the lines on is actually going to be really difficult. So I'm going to make them even to my eye on the other side. Um, it's really good to get this to work visually for your eye. Uh, you can't always trust your marks. And as you can see, they'll just, they can steer you wrong. They, they give you false guidance sometimes. So that kind of, yeah, that's pretty darn good. Uh, maybe it's a little more curvy here than here, but actually it feels pretty darn, pretty darn right. So there's our basic sword shape. Now what do we do? I'm glad you asked. What now we are going to do is we're going to shape this blade. We're going to consider that it has four planes and we're going to shape those planes. Um, we're not going to get super, super exacting and perfectionist with this. That is not the point of this build. Um, however, I do need a couple more reference lines. I've got a nice center line there. I'm going to need another one on the other side. Let's draw that. Just by eye is plenty on such a thing. Now I have a center line on both sides. And now I need a center line here along the edge. And I'm going to do that line the same way I did the other lines. So you see, I just bring my finger up here like this. And again, this line is, you know, if you can sight it up center by your eye, you're probably fine. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, there we go. That's it. Now I have a nice center line. I have four center lines. And now I think you can see the four planes that I want to shape. What I want to do with this sword is I want to shape this plane down and this plane and this plane and this plane. So how do I do that? Well, you could if you wanted to. You could if you wanted to use 50 grit sandpaper and just do that. Now, one of the things that you're doing is I'm softening this edge, but now I have this reference line. I don't want to go past it. So as I sand, I'm going to be avoiding both this center line and this center edge line. Um, don't worry too much about this, this, because you'll be finessing that later. But I just want to remove a bunch of material. Right away, you can see that I've got a kind of a nice curve on there. And my goal will be to leave only the black mark. That's, that's how sharp I want this sword to be, which is to say, not very sharp at all. By the way, I cannot vouch that this sword will be acceptable for um, cons. Uh, there are all sorts of different rules at every con about things that look like weapons and how you walk through them with. Please check the rules of your local con when we're doing cons again, which I hope is soon, because man, I really miss cons. How many times can I say con in a few sentences? Con, con, con. There are some pros and there are some cons. Actually, right now, there's a bunch of pros with no cons to go to. That's almost a joke. I'm going to move on. Fifty grit sandpaper takes off a lot of material very quickly, and.
as you can see, I did a bunch of that shaping on my belt sander. Um, when I put an 80, uh, an 80 grit sanding belt on my belt sander, you can buy uh, heavy sanding belts for almost any belt sander uh, if you have access to one. But again, you don't need to. You could use just this, and you can sit there and do all of this shaping by hand. The only reason I did this is because we're having a heat wave in San Francisco, and I didn't feel like being sweaty today after doing this for like about an hour. That's about what it would take, about an hour of your time. And I'm gonna, gonna do all the final shaping with this though. And what's funny is the very same skills you're using to do this, actually you could use a piece of metal and make a sword out of metal. It just takes a lot longer. Um, the technique is about the same. You know, you cut out the shape, make sure it's nice. Then you start to actually make your reference marks and you start sculpting down to those reference marks. The nice thing about your hand for the finishing work is that um, it actually smooths out a lot of the crimes that you could add in by using a belt sander. I get a lot of these witness marks. Can you see them? It's hard to see. Uh, and your hand sanding takes care of that. Ah, this piece of wood I'm using is poplar. I just happen to have some around. Um, but again, any softwood, pine, whatever you've got access to will work fine. I wouldn't try plywood. Plywood, you could do this out of plywood. It's just gonna be a little trickier because you're asking a lot of plywood when you start to do that and ask for a finished surface. Look at how far we've come. We are like minutes away from LARPing. Okay. Not exactly minutes, but this is very satisfying already. We're gonna take it a couple steps farther. The 80 grit, not great as a finished surface. I'm gonna go to 120 grit wrapped around the same block. I lied, 150. 120, 150, I consider them almost interchangeable a lot of the time. Uh, and all you're doing is just trying to get rid of all the big scratch marks. And now you don't have to worry about, about trying to stay away from the lines because um, you can't sand off too much material with this stuff. You're just trying to get it to feel nice and smooth and you will feel the difference. You will feel the difference between the finished side and the unfinished side. And you can go ahead and sand right over top of your marker marks. You are kind of done with them right now. For those of you who study juggling, I found that teaching myself how to juggle made me somewhat ambidextrous. Not entirely ambidextrous, but I can switch things between hands. So I can sand with my left hand or my right hand. And that's nice, because every single day my muscle mass is decreasing. You can go as far as you want with this, with this moment of sanding. Uh, you can take this all the way up to 180 grit if you want. And then at that point, huh, you got it to 180 or really like 220, you can stain this. Uh, but we are not going to. We are going to aestheticize this. However, our blade is mostly fleshed out. Pretty pleased with it. A few more little rough patches to smooth away. Yeah, it feels good. Um, and now we're going to make the cross guard, the thing that protects your hand. Actually, this piece of wood, which came off the side of this, is actually perfect. Look at that. Absolutely perfect. Uh, however, it's got the Sharpie marks on it. I don't like Sharpie marks. Am I going to let that be a deal breaker? No, I'm not. I'm going to use this piece of wood. It's a great little scrap, and it literally is like proportionally... I like that look. I dig it. It's, it's working for me. Now, a finger plane is also a totally reasonable tool with which to do this shaping if that's what you are comfortable with. It's a little more of an advanced move and clamping it down is going to be a little bit tough, but, you know, I can actually do the finishing of my edges here 
using the finger plane and get a kind of what looks like a sort of a, a roughly sharpened edge. Ooh, that's kind of nice. Now I've ended up with a little nick because I took off a little too much material because I got ambitious, um, but that's okay. Little nicks on this thing are actually going to make it look, I think, even a little bit better, to be perfectly honest. Okay, great. We're working on this thing. Okay, so I want to slice that there. You can make this cut with a handsaw without any difficulty. I've got a bandsaw here, so I'm going to use it. So now I want to make sure that I'm going to put this in the center. Three and quarters, three and an eighth, three and an eighth. Yeah, eighth. Now I need to cut out that shape. And again, you could just use a coping saw for this. It's totally easy, and I think that's what I'm going to do. First thing we're going to do to make this cut is we're going to drill a little hole in each of the four corners with a hand drill. Precision is non-critical, although having your drill bit properly mounted in your drill is. Now there's a specific way in which I'm drilling these holes, which is each hole, can you see that, is on the inside of the line. That's, that's a key trick. So now you can see I've got four holes drilled into the corners. It's not perfectly exact. That's okay. We're going to hide those crimes. We won't see them later. Outstanding. That is perfect for our purposes right now. Great. Sharp-eyed viewers might have watched me do that and thought, eh, what the hell kind of saw is that? And, well, it's actually a pretty special saw. This is a titanium coping saw built by the wonderful geniuses at New Concepts, K-N-E-W Concepts. This is a spendy piece of kit, but it is one of the more beautiful tools I have in my collection. Um, I got to tell you, you know, when I receive something and I see a particular balance of colors in the anodization, I know I'm working with people who are paying attention to the, the right things. I'm not saying that the color is the most important thing. I'm just saying that when I see a balance of color like this, I know that someone has spent time getting those things right. This is a, uh, a truss structured water cut titanium riveted frame. It is in incredibly rigid, uh, and it is my go-to coping saw. I've had it for years, and I think it actually is one of the very first tool tips I ever did on Tested, and we'll link to it below so you can learn about the other things that they make, because they make even more extreme and cool coping saws. Uh, so I have my cross guard. I have the piece that should go into it, but it doesn't quite yet because it's a little tight. That's fine. I want it to be tight. Um, I want to loosen this up a little bit, and I'm going to do that with some sanding sticks. When I worked at Industrial Light Magic, when I was a model maker, I used to make my own sanding sticks, and I'd make them of every grade. Uh, and I'd probably make them about twice a year. So I'd take tongue depressors, which, by the way, a full box of tongue depressors should be in every maker's shop. Uh, not expensive, fantastic to use as all sorts of things, wedges and... Uh, paint applicators, and scrapers, etc., and also for depressing tongues. Uh, what I would do is I would spray glue on one side of these and spray glue on, let's say, a piece of 150 grit sandpaper. Then I'd lay them down, cut them out, 
And on the back, I'd write 150, 150, like that. And then I always knew which sanding stick I was going for. And that allowed me to do what I like to call climbing the sanding ladder, right? So you start with the 80, the 100, the 120, 150, 180, 220, 320, all the way up to, you know, 400, 600. But yeah, really, 220 is about what most model making would ever need, unless you're doing highly polished parts. I used to make these twice a year. I'd make a whole set of like 10 or 15 of each grade, as many as I could fit on a, on a, on a piece of sandpaper. And then I discovered that they sell this at beauty shops. This is a nail salon file and you can buy them in every grade. You don't need to go through all that trouble. And I haven't since. But I am going to use some of these sanding sticks to just open up and refine this hole. Oh, that one's too wide. There we go. And I'm just straightening up the sides, cleaning it up. And I've got a little edge one here I've cut. You know what? I think I might take an exacto blade and fix that a little bit. I'm trying to show the variety of ways in which every step of this build could be done. I just don't want anyone to watch this and think, well, I can't do that because I don't have X. And literally, if you like have a piece of sandpaper and something that cuts stuff, I mean, I, I guess you could do this whole build with a Swiss Army knife if you were so inclined. Man, if somebody does this whole build with a Swiss Army knife, I'd love to know about it. It's not me. I don't have that kind of energy anymore. So, let's see here. That is pretty close. That is, that is great. Um, the tighter you get this, the easier your work later will be. Um, but now, it needs a little bit of shaping because I don't, this isn't perfect. And so I want to get a little bit more of a refined shape out of this guy. So I'm going to do a little marking on it. All right, so what do I mean by shaping and refining? Well, I, I would like this, I don't think a cross guard should have these big flat, it shouldn't just be rectangular, it should have a little bit of finesse to it. So I'm going to start with the center line, again using the same technique with my fingers to just do a rough center. And I'm going to make the assumption that perhaps, oh, actually that's kind of nice. Yeah, why don't we try this? I'm literally gonna use this for my reference marks and you'll see kind of how I think through something like this sometimes. So I've gone a popsicle sticks width away from each side. Actually, that's not quite square, so that's better. Uh, and then uh, I want the ends to be about like this. And again, I'm just using my eye and this is really accurate. By the way, if you go to like an armor museum, you will notice like almost nothing is perfect. In fact, it looks much more like somebody was using their eye all along. So I'm just going to now join up these marks I've got. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I'm just gonna, oh right, so this is what I wanna cut off. That's what I'm gonna cut off and this will be my cross guard. So I'm gonna do it on the bandsaw. Nice, all right. We're just gonna sand that a little bit. Now, I could do all sorts of stuff. I could round these edges. I could drill some holes in here. I could put some filigree around it. And all of that is totally up to you. You can do whatever you want with this part. This is, I'm just showing you one way that I have done it. So I think it's time to take this and this and make them one. All right, so for this, there is a million ways in which you can do it. I'm just going to clamp the sword in the vise here like that. And I am going to work my piece down. Ah, that, that kind of fit, exactly the kind of fit you want. Uh, it sits, it holds the blade. It doesn't rattle very much. That is a nice positive fit. And we are, um, 
we are really close to our, to our sword. See that? Look at that. Yeah. Okay. Now, time to finish this bottom. How are we going to do that? Great question. Here's what I'm going to use. I'm going to use this to be the pommel of my sword, the, 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 the base under the handle. This is a table leg that I sawed off something. I can't even remember what I sawed this off. What did I saw this off? I don't know. So I'm going to use this table leg. I'm going to cut out a couple of slices of it on a bandsaw. And um, yeah, you'll see just how simple this can be. These three pieces are all I'm going to use for the pommel. Uh, I am going to, the pommel's going to end up looking like that, right? Just a, just a diamond shape. That's it. That's really, really simple. Um, but in order to do that, and, and by the way, this table leg, those are totally cuts you could do with a coping saw or a hand saw or anything you've got available to you. Um, what I'm now going to do is I'm going to make a mark on this middle part in order to, uh, well, you'll see how I'm doing. I'm holding the middle part in its orientation, and I am going to do a, that's it. Now I'm gonna cut that out also on the bandsaw. I thought I was recording. I thought I was recording and I wasn't. Um, let me get, what I need is a pommel with a square hole that this fits into. There are ways you could do that with chisels and drills and precision. Um, I've never been that good a woodworker to get that kind of result. So I do it piecemeal. I'm gonna slice this out on the bandsaw and then I'm gonna sandwich it between two pieces. And just like a cooking show, this is what I end up with. It is three pieces sandwiched together, except because I've cut out this middle part, I have this perfectly square hole that perfectly fits the grip of my sword. Look at that. Yeah. And by the way, this is precisely the way that I did the handle on my uh, Hellboy Samaritan. This is, I, I did it in pieces rather than trying to drill and chisel out a perfectly square hole. This allowed me a lot more, that is a great sound, is it? Yeah, uh, that allowed me exactly that kind of precision. And look, I, I got pretty close. That's just because I have a long, long, like a lifetime of kind of sussing this out and getting it close. You may be farther away, doesn't really matter. Doesn't really matter. Now, we have our pommel, we have our guard, we have our grip, we have our blade. Those are the four main parts of a sword. We are almost done with the form of this sword. However, this handle isn't very comfortable. I don't like holding on to it. So I want to make it a little bit more comfy and more substantial. And that's where this comes in. This is the tip of an old cane um, that I cut off for some other project. I can't even remember what, but I have a practice in my shop that is if it's small and round, I'm keeping it because round things are eventually always useful. Seriously, round things are eventually always useful. That, that should be a t-shirt. Um, this is just a piece of round wood. It's roughly uh, three quarters of an inch in diameter. I'm going to slice it and slice it. And I'm going to use those two pieces to round out this grip a little bit. A note, if I was gonna do this without the bandsaw, I would do those cuts in reverse order. I would line up my handsaw on this piece clamped into a vise, I'd slice down, and then I would slice out. Um, I am, let's see here, 
So this is actually really great. I'm, I really like how that feels and how that looks. Um, but I think this transition's a little rough there. So on my sander, and again, you could use just a block, block sander if you want it. On my sander, I'm just gonna finesse that bottom edge. That's all. This is rapidly becoming one of my favorite one day builds ever. I'm having a blast. Oh, I forgot the sword over there. <laughs> Look at that. We, I, I'm literally like an hour into this build myself. I've been filming this in real time. Uh, so uh, the next thing I would do is, yep. so I'm gonna glue that on both sides. And again, you could use wood glue. Anything you've got in the house will work. Hell's bells. The way I'm about to address this, you could use double stick tape if you really wanted to. Yeah, we'll see. Now we're gonna give it a really nice feeling grip. That is that is important. For good play, it should feel great. And that's where your kitchen twine comes in. It's only gonna take a little bit of this stuff. Um, and Seriously, any string you've got will do for this part. It's really not that complicated. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna glue in one little, little part of it here. Let that set. And then I'm just gonna wind this around itself. And I'm not gonna try and go all the way like perfectly next to each other. I'm actually gonna see how the spiral is going. I'm actually going to do this all the way up. You will see the method to my madness later, but it will make this grip feel great and look great. There are little things you can do, details like this, which helps sell something. And also, you know, if it feels good. You give it to an actor and it feels good. It becomes part of their character. I really, I still am sad that they didn't buy those swords for me for that Shakespeare play. I really would have loved to have. But San Francisco in the 90s was an amazing theater town. There was theater everywhere, but that also meant that it was super, super low rent theater. So it was like budgets were tight, man. Some of my first model making jobs I did for free as long as they paid for materials because at the beginning of your career, materials are your expensive, are your big expense. Time is your least expensive thing. Later on, that formula reverses itself. Okay, so. There we go. I'm going to put a little dot of glue there now up there. I don't have to be perfect about it. I just want to stop it from unraveling. There, like that. And I, uh, great. Okay. Now, I think, yeah, I think I can um, glue that in. I think I can glue this part in. So let's uh, just jam some glue in there, jam some glue in there. Up on the side, yep. And okay, and I'll pre-release this. There we go. Those two parts are now one. They are one. There can be only one. Okay. Couple more steps to go. Couple more steps to go. Uh, the next step for me is paint. And I am going to give this a coat of just some uh, some black paint. Black paint? Let me see what I got. I'm just going to use a little gray primer on this, some flat gray primer. Um, I'm going to break out my... Uh, blow dryer and my respirator. Give me a second. Whoa. That is really nice and thick. You don't have to do any masking for this paint operation. You can paint right onto the blade if you like. Doesn't matter. You'll see why in a minute.
Now, we're gonna do one more bit of aestheticizing of this, uh, because these strings aren't glued in. You could glue them in. You could actually paint those all with white glue and make a very nice looking handle. I'm gonna wrap mine in electrical tape, because it's quick and dirty. And I'm gonna take one of the tricks with electrical tape is it'll last for freaking ever on something if you uh, if you don't overstretch it. It likes to unstretch itself. So I start out there and then I slowly wind my way up, eliminating any buckles. And now the string makes it look like I knew what I was doing. I know that's one of my favorites. And now, rather than tear at the end, if you want the electrical tape to last, just give it a cut and bring it in. Just like, yeah, there you go. Now, take a look at that. That is a very, I gotta tell you, from a hand feel standpoint, that is fantastic. Oh yeah! We have our basic colors, and again, you could do anything you wanted with this. You could put a jewel here. If you have some costume jewelry, drill a hole, stick a big jewel there, glue it in with hot glue. You wanna add some filigree around the edges, go grab an old like disposable dinner plate with a pattern on it you like and glue that on. Uh, some copper tape, striping tape, markers, Fimo, whatever you wanted you could use to augment and dress this up. You could drill some holes and sculpt in some super sculpey and then bake it at a low temperature in your oven. The world is your oyster. I am just giving you the basic framework, but now it's time to make this blade look great. And just to do a final fit and polish, I'm just gonna, now that I've got a handle, I'm just gonna make sure that it's nice and smooth. It's time to put on the aluminum tape. Oh, also swords like this, really great for balancing because they're heavier on top and as long as you stare at the pommel, they're pretty easy to balance. Yeah. The deadly juggler. A movie no one's ever going to make. <laughs> so again, I'm gonna peel the backing off my aluminum tape. And when you're peeling aluminum tape, stop right there stop right there and get a handle on it because it likes to curl up. So now I'm gonna lay it in right, right there. And I'm butting this right up to the other piece of aluminum. You could overlap it by a tiny bit. That's completely fine. And so I am. And now I'm gonna do the same treatment I did before, using the pad of my thumb and the backs of my fingernails to just slowly work this in. Look at how the tape line gives us a kind of a dividing fuller on the blade that is sort of this added bonus that looks pretty freaking cool. Oh, there's little worm holes in my actual wood. That's fine. I care not. And you'll see, there's the edge. You no, know, I'm getting pretty close. Okay, time for some exacto trimming. And we're halfway there. We are halfway, we are halfway there. And I hope you're feeling the same way I am, which is, damn, that looks way better than I thought it would. <laughs> That's it. The uh, side of a Sharpie is great for this smoothing operation. Uh, separating the backing from doubles, from sticky tape, always a thing. Again, stop right there, yep. There we go. Okay, so. Ah, 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 I got it stuck to itself. Yep, there we go. Okay, that piece is no good. Again, right up to the edge. Oh, I went a little too far. You don't have very many opportunities to reseed it, but you can take them. And again, the tape is inexpensive, so. Ah, all right. 
there. And again, just gently from, from the center line, I make sure the center line is good, and then the rest kind of falls into place. And the back of a Sharpie is great for this. The, the, the trunk of a Sharpie is fantastic for this kind of burnishing. That is what we are doing. We are burnishing the aluminum onto the wood. This edge is a very forgiving edge. Um, obviously, it helps if you cut pretty close to the edge, but it doesn't have to be a perfectly straight line, honestly. Um, because it's the edge, it will hide a lot of crimes. All right. Oh, I cut off a little too much there. Again, that's fine. You can hit that a little bit later. You'll see. Oh, there we go. Here's a method for getting the backing off is to get an X-Acto and split it. You actually get pretty good at that over the years. And there we go, right up to the edge. And by the way, I'm also using my fingers as a brace for the X-Acto blade as I make this cut. They're not braced against anything, but they are sort of serving as a kind of a carriage riding on the top of the, of the sword while I cut, in the same way that I was making the marks earlier. So now we, oh, 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 come on. Come on, there we go. I mean, yeah, this, this was a piece of scrap wood, a table leg, some string electrical tape, some extra scrap wood, and some plumber's tape. Ladies and gentlemen, $5 sword. Yeah. That is a very satisfying one day build. For me, even, I hope that many of you try this, and if you do, I'm dying to see what you make with them, what kind of sword, what your inspiration was, where you started, where you ended up. Please share it in the comments below. Please send it to us at testedinfo at tested.com. Um, we really want to know what you made using this technique. And again, I've really left it as broad, as broad as humanly possible. Uh, if the, uh, if this edge, actually it looks way better on camera than it does in person. If this edge bothers you, you could spray this blade with some black primer and then sand it back off with some steel wool or a uh, scotch bright or the green scrungy part of your kitchen sponge would also take that paint down and do a kind of a final spit and polish on your aluminum tape. Um, I hope this shows you some of the possibilities inherent. If you wanted to get better, you could actually facet these four planes that I described earlier. You could sand them so that each one is a visible facet. That takes a lot more practice, takes a lot more training and understanding, but it's doable. You could, uh, you could cut this out. You could cut a fuller out and then fill it with, let's say, a uh, 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 lightweight plumber's epoxy or something like that, and then tape over that and you get a fuller. Yeah, there's so, so many possibilities, but it all begins with the scrap materials with which you can make I hope you had as much fun as I did. This might be one of the fastest real-time one-day builds I have ever done, and it is without a doubt the most satisfying. Thank you guys for joining me for this. Oh, look, you can even see the camera. Thank you guys for joining me for this. I will see you next time. Oh, I can't turn the camera off. I have to use my finger.
Thanks for watching that video. If there's a video equivalent of the Clean Plate Club, you're a member. Uh, if you want to support us, one of the best ways you can do it is going to our merch store and purchasing one of our beautiful new posters. This is my hand-drawn sketch of uh, my two toolboxes that I used when I was an active model maker at Industrial Light and Magic in the late 90s and the early aughts. There's also on the far left side of the poster a list of all of the tools I had in these toolboxes and I used them daily for almost a decade. Again, you can get your own version of this printed on a beautiful cardstock by following the links below.